Okay, hi everybody and good afternoon. Uh, this is the 20th of um, August and we're continuing with uh, Letters on Occult Meditation video commentary and we're into a new section and this is um, Okay, <laughs> I, I think I was pantomiming there a little bit. Anyway, we're into a new section, um, Letters on Occult Meditation, Video Commentary Program 24, and we're starting Dangers to be Avoided in Meditation. Looks like a rather long uh, section here, you know, maybe even 52 pages, possibly. And we will uh, begin our reading, uh, Dangers to be Avoided in Meditation. And we are recording. Yes, okay. There's so many little things to keep, uh, keep on track. <laughs> All right. So, the dangers inherent in the personality, dangers arising from karma, dangers arising from subtle forces. July 22nd, 1920, just about 100 years and one month ago. This was coming through to uh, Alice Bailey. There are many personality problems and even our entire planetary logos on a cosmic level has an issue with personality. It has not yet been subdued and will not be until the third cosmic initiation and our planetary logos is only aiming for the second cosmic initiation. So what holds good, generally, by analogy, for the planetary logos holds good for uh, the human being. And the karmic situation does intervene, as it did intervene in H.P. Blavatsky's life. I think she was supposed to write still more, but the uh, Tibetan said, well, karma intervened. And then the whole question about... Uh, subtle attack and subtle forces and even if they're not malevolent they have to be handled rightly i think uh, torquem saradarian has written extensively on some of these uh, subtle subtle forces uh, and uh, especially the inimical ones so Let's kind of uh, highlight these, increase them a bit, and uh, know where we're starting from, page 87. So, the withholding of information under the dangers of, uh, to be avoided in occult meditation. I think we should, you know, pay a lot of attention to what the Tibetan says here. We have reached a point now where the foundations of knowledge have been laid, that knowledge which instills into the wise student the desire to submit to the necessary rules, to conform to the uh, prescribed, uh, prescribed requirements, and to make the comprehended mental concepts practical in the experience of daily life. And, you know, we've been reading now, and once is never enough, <laughs> but let's just uh, ask, has that happened for us? And do we have that desire 
to submit to the <clears throat> necessary rules, to conform to the prescribed requirements and to make the comprehended um, mental concepts, practical experiences in daily life. Do we have that? And, uh, and I think if we put this in planetary terms, you will see uh, much of Saturn is here indicated. Submission, uh, conformity, and practicality. Those are, you know, this is why Saturn is such a friend to the developing uh, disciple, even though the personality does not prefer it. And uh, informity, yeah. The desire is wise and right, and the object of all that has been imparted but at this juncture, it may be wise to sound a warning note to point out certain dangerous possibilities and to put the student on his guard against an enthusiasm, you know, Ray Six, Mars, Neptune, that may lead him along paths that will hinder development and that may build up vibrations that will ultimately have to be offset. This entails delay and a recapitulation in work that, if realized in time, might be obviated. Um, so he certainly does want to save uh, us time. And he wants to see that we do not needlessly uh, repeat what we need not repeat if we are more, more cautious. Um, I think, you know, in, on the path of occultism, um, enthusiasm is much to be desired, but it can go too far. Uh, it can go beyond wise restraint. When you see how seventh ray magicians operate, they do operate um, with caution and restraint. Otherwise, they know that their magical operations can lead to considerable damage and even to death, which would be the uh, ending of opportunity for that particular incarnation. So it takes a while to build these things in. I know in the beginning we may think that, okay, um, this is a wonderful path and there's going to be nothing but uh, excitement and uh, uh, glory lying on ahead. And we're carried along by waves of our own enthusiastic aspiration. While we do have to maintain enthusiastic aspiration, it cannot overcome wise restraint amidst all those dangers. If you were uh, walking a narrow path, I saw once a, a kind of a movie um, that showed the life of some of these martial artists in the uh, Far East. And there were contests um, in within a ring, you know, and all the way around the ring were sharp protrusions. So that if you fell out of the ring or were forced out of the ring, you might end up impaled upon one of those uh, sort of uh, daggers. Uh, all around, there is danger. 
and we cannot um, tread too lightly. Uh, there are places where dancing is, is allowed <laughs> and other places where dancing is dangerous. So certain statements and instructions cannot be made or given in writing, in writing, uh, so that suggests uh, for three reasons, but writing, so an oral tradition indicated. And why, why is this? So uh, number one, some instructions are always given orally as they appeal to the intuition and are not for the pondering of the logical reasoning lower mind. It must be something that is carried in the oral transmission, which stimulates the intuition. They also contain elements of danger if submitted to the unready and when we're dealing with uh, material that is uh, widely publicized, inevitably the unready will uh, get hold of the material and, and probably try to do something <laughs> that prematurely. So uh, in this case, uh, oral, it seems that um, what he's saying here is that uh, oral transmission promotes uh, in intuitive response. Okay, that's one thing. He does <clears throat> repeat often why he cannot give what uh, we might wish for him to give. But you can imagine with all kinds of experimentation going on, people will get themselves into real trouble that has implications for not only the present incarnation, but for the future and an uncontrolled situation, non-productive of results for the divine plan, will develop. Number two here, some instructions pertain to the secrets of the path and are mainly applicable to the groups to which the student is attached. They can only be given in joint instruction when out of the physical body and probably the hours of sleep contain uh, such moments of instruction. But this is a very occult kind of uh, statement here that these instructions pertain to the group causal body to certain ray secrets and to the invoking of the assistance of the higher devas to bring about desired results. So who would suspect, you know, under normal concrete minded consciousness that there are such impartations given, but uh, only on the inner planes. And when we think about our groups, we should also think about the group causal body and how it is being enriched by members of the group or maybe not, maybe enrichment prevented. Ray secrets? higher devas. Okay, even this is the revelation of maybe what for us is unsuspected. DK gives us so much information that essentially is unsuspected by us in our normal waking consciousness. And so he's made a, uh, a link between inner happenings and our, uh, the outer way of conducting our life. 
So, uh, and so therefore, these kinds of instructions are not uh, admissible for casual uh, transmission, unregulated transmission. Reminds me of the star Regulus, right? And the idea of regulation, rulership, self-rulership, part of the lion, you know. The dangers attached thereto are too great to permit of their being communicated in an exoteric publication. The occult effects of the spoken word and of the written word are diverse and interesting. Um, well, anyway, this is about the dangers. Um, inevitably, people who are unready will get hold of exoteric publications, thinking, of course, that they are ready when they are not. Um, it's just, just the nature of things. And, you know, we have these days of the internet such uh, easy access, really. Um, to a wide range of subjects. So the occult effects of the spoken word and of the written word are diverse and interesting. There seems to be more intimacy, you know, in the spoken word and this kind of tradition of uh, passing secrets on in an oral manner is preserved in certain brotherhoods, sisterhoods, which uh, in a way imitate the uh, inner uh, initiatory rites, R-I-T-E-S. So differences exist between spoken transmission and written transmission until such time as you have among you a wise teacher and physical person. And, um, you know, I can say, I anticipate that DK will be one such. And until it is possible for him to gather around him, his students, thus affording them the protection of his aura because there can be invasion and obsession and uh, just simply unwise mismanagement, you know. Thus affording them the protection of his aura and its stimulating vibration and until such time as the world conditions permit of a certain period of relaxation from the present strain and suspense and uh, it's obvious, is it not, that uh, we are in a very strained and suspenseful condition right now. It will not be possible to impart forms, invocations, and mantras of a specific character. Well, the antidote exists, you know and the protective methods uh, exist as we're shown in um, a treatise on white magic, one of those rules. Um, let's see if I can find that, you know, just a uh, treatise on white magic right at the very beginning, you know, um, the mantric, um, let's see if I can find this, maybe rule, rule 11 has some of this, uh, here it is. 
the rule 11 still a still a rule um, for the astral plane three things the worker with the law must now accomplish you know basically the seventh ray worker or using seventh ray methods first ascertain the formula which will confine the lives within the ensphering wall. Next, pronounce the words which will tell them what to do and where to carry that which has been made, and this is the point here. Finally, utter forth the mystic phrase which will save him from their work. That's the one we're looking for, especially. Okay. I'm going back. So, um, until all this is done and the mantrams are given, um, sub rosa, so to speak, you know, underneath the rose. There's, Tui has done some research about that and what it really means. It's probably within the uh, energy of the soul and discreetly communicated. It will not be, it will not be possible to impart the forms, invocations and mantrams, protected mantrams uh, and mantrams, I want to say, uh, often of the protective variety. Um, it will not be possible to arouse the head centers to the necessary evolutionary rate as they, you know, they do control the lesser centers, except in a few cases where certain pupils, perhaps unconsciously, to themselves are being subjected to definite processes which result in a greatly increased rate of vibration. This is only done to a few in each country and is directly under the eye of the master, focusing through HPB. Um, And that's interesting because here in 1920, uh, some 20-something years after the end of her last incarnation, we're seeing uh, what she's carrying on here in the early 1920s. So going back to her uh, date of death, uh, what was it, in the 1890s, early 1890s, uh, we now learn that by the year 1920, at least, when this was being written, she has other uh, duties. And some of this uh, supervision uh, of certain people who can um, submit to the training, even if unconsciously, uh, certain trainings being attempted. Okay. So all kinds of occult things are happening. Basically, it means simply hidden from the eye, you know, has nothing to do with the conception of, you know, the occult uh, as popularly conceived as if it were some very, uh, creepy and uh, disgusting misuse of uh, powers to overcome the will of others. Maybe certain types use that information in that way. But we are uh, students of spiritual occultism, meaning that we want to use the now hidden laws to bring out the best in ourselves and in others. 
So the motive is entirely uh, different. Yeah. And so, and DK does specify that really very few uh, are having these impartations of invocations and forms and mantras, um, except a few individuals, individual cases, very few experience these uh, advanced impartations. And you know, it's, it's best to consider ourselves, says DK, as average disciples. Otherwise we develop a big head about it, you know, and uh, fall victim to a really retarding force, uh, the force of egotism. Yeah, that is what we don't want. Okay, and we continue here with uh, reasons why certain information cannot be given in a exoterically uh, published form. Number three here, information as to the invoking of devas in meditation cannot yet be safely given to individuals though a beginning is being made with groups such as in the rituals of the Masonic Masons and the uh, rituals of the Masons and of the church. <clears throat> uh, formulas that put the lesser devas under the control of man will not yet be imparted. Human beings are not yet um, to be trusted with that power, for the majority are but animated by selfish desire and would misuse it for their own ends. I think we see this when power is presented to people and accessible to them, even if they are in highly responsible positions, they think personally, they do not think um, in terms of the welfare of the group. It is deemed by the wise teachers of the race, as I, um, let's see, where are we? As I have said before, that the dangers of too little knowledge are much less than the dangers of too much, and that the race can be more seriously hindered by the misapplication. Notice he thinks in terms of the entire race and not just of the welfare of the few, that the race can be more seriously hindered by the misapplication of powers gained by incipient occultists than it can by a lack of knowledge that engenders not a karmic, um, let's see here, karmic results, yeah. So we'll just have to get used to this idea that we are under supervision and that when it is wise and useful uh, for the advancement of the plan for everybody, that a particular individual um, be given access to forms and uh, mantrams and formulas, etc., then that will be done. So one of the really important things to cultivate uh, is patience in this whole pursuit. 
And that, of course, depends on a broad perspective and on the realization that in the eyes of the soul, a, a life of the personality is but a fleeting moment. And we can carry that, you know, even further <laughs> in the light of the uh, self-awareness of the uh, super universal deity. Even a universe is but a fleeting moment. And um, we may even learn that moments don't really exist. That depends on sequence and on sequence depends on division and division doesn't exist. So in Mahamaya, yes, but not in reality. But, you know, I don't think we're all ready for such thoughts. I know that I couldn't live my Mahamayavic life if I was always having such thoughts. And I think it's true for so many of us. We have to learn how to handle things as they appear to be before we can come closer to handling things as we are. The um, powers gained in meditation, the capacities achieved by the adjustment of the bodies through meditation, the faculties developed in each vehicle by definite formulas in meditation. Um, the manipulation of matter that is one of the functions of the occultists, the result of well adjusted vehicles that respond perfectly to plane conditions and the attainment of causal consciousness, a consciousness that carries with it the ability to include within itself all the lesser, all the lesser are of too serious a character to be lightly disposed of. And in the training of man along these lines, only those are encouraged by the teacher who can be trusted. Uh, let's see, what does it say here? Only those, uh, yeah, by the teacher, are encouraged by the teacher. Only those who can be trusted are encouraged by the teacher. So let's look at a few of these factors that he's uh, dealing with. <clears throat> and um, this is simple instruction. So Yeah, and he's going to go into an illustration here. The powers that are gained in meditation and the capacities achieved by the adjustment of the bodies through meditation. Okay, those are two. The faculties developed in each vehicle by definite formulas in meditation. And what else? The manipulation of matter. Um, that is one of the functions of occultist, of the occultist. And the attainment of causal consciousness and maybe we can recognize when causal consciousness is dawning upon us, a consciousness that carries with it the ability to include within itself all the lesser types of 
personality consciousness, vehicular consciousness, are of too serious a character to be lightly disposed of uh, and in the training of man along these lines, only those are encouraged by the teacher who can be trusted. So I'm going to uh, kind of uh, number these. The um, capacities, number two and the faculties, number three, uh, and the manipulation of matter, number four, and um, the attainment of causal consciousness, number five. All of this, you know, lies ahead. They cannot be uh, easily made public. And the teacher has to assess the um, condition of the individual to whom <clears throat> uh, impartation is being uh, considered. So in what sense trusted? Trusted in what sense? Trusted <clears throat> to think in group terms and not in terms of self. Trusted to use the knowledge gained anent the bodies and the karma of environing associates solely for their wise assistance and not for selfish purposes. Trusted to use occult powers for the furtherance of evolution and for the development on all planes of the schemes of evolution as planned by the three great lords. So these are the areas of trust and let us ask ourselves seriously, are we to be trusted? Are we to be trusted? It's a serious question. Trust in what way? To number one, think in group terms. Uh, number two, to use the knowledge gained. Um, <clears throat> and then the bodies and the karma for their the wise assistance of others and not for selfish purposes. Uh, you know, sometimes people assess the condition of another and they determine that this person can be manipulated and they manipulate them <clears throat> for their own purposes. Trusted to use occult powers for the furtherance of evolution and the development on all planes of the schemes, more than just the earth scheme eventually, um, as planned by the three great lords, the Manu Bodhisattva Mahachohan. So let me illustrate, he says. <clears throat> One of the things accomplished in meditation when pursued with regularity and under correct instruction is the transference of the consciousness of the lower self into the higher. Okay, well, it's almost a platitude. We, we take this for granted. Consciousness is usually <clears throat> resident um, within the personality for so many, and yet um, causal consciousness uh, is a desirable achievement. And we work on that, if, uh, and then we can uh, more truly meditate, uh, more 
truly contemplate. Maybe even contemplation doesn't even begin until we can somewhat do that. So um, the transfer from the lower into the higher, this carries with it <clears throat> the capacity to see on causal levels, intuitively to recognize facts in the lives of others, to foresee events and occurrences, and to know the relative value of a personality. And this can only be permitted when the student can be silent, selfless, and stable, using the mnemonic of repeated uh, letters to begin words. So when you have this kind of power, you know, you don't want to be taking advantage of the people into whom uh, you can see. To see on causal levels, um, number one, and to uh, recognize facts intuitively, and to foresee events, as obviously the Tibetan seems to have a knowledge of upcoming events in the lives of his students, and you know maybe when they will uh, depart the dense physical plane. I remember he was saying uh, to a uh, to an individual who later was. Uh, killed in the war, the Second World War, that his time for awakening in the light, uh, free from the bonds of flesh, had was not yet. The Tibetan could see when that was coming, and he also saw the karma of it related to the French Revolution. and to know the relative value of a personality. These are secret matters, really. And this can only be permitted when the student can be silent, selfless, and stable, you know, not to uh, misuse the knowledge and then regret it later because of a flight <clears throat> of instability. Yeah, who as yet can answer to all these requirements, maybe one or two, we can answer to. But the requirements are so many, you know. And um, we're not in the position to fulfill all of them. I am endeavoring to give you a general idea of the dangers incident to the too early development of the powers achieved in meditation. And, you know, are we wise enough to listen to this uh, with an open mind? I seek to sound a note not of discouragement, but of <clears throat> of insistence upon physical purity, on emotional stability, and on mental equilibrium before the student passes on to greater uh, knowledge. Well, that's only wise. Forewarned is forearmed. And we are more prepared for what we will uh, necessarily encounter. <clears throat> only as the channel opens to the intuition and closes to the animal nature. Interesting exchange. 
Can a man wisely proceed with his work? Only as the heart enlarges its capacity to suffer with all that breathes, to love all that is contacted, and to understand and sympathize with the least desirable of God's creatures, can the work go forward as desired. Now that's uh, somehow a very touching, very touching statement. I find myself with the reaction to it. Um, and that means, you know, where does the so-called enemy fit uh, in our um, assessment? Can we suffer with all that breathes? Can we understand and sympathize with even the least desirable of God's creatures. And this, of course, has to do with human beings and with tiny little elemental uh, lives. Maybe some sects take it too far, you know. They will not even harm the mosquito who may be carrying a deadly disease. But that calls for an adjustment of relative values. And it's interesting that the intuition opens and the Martian animal nature is subdued. So the, in a way, the red gives way to the blue speaking in, you know, symbolic terms, but maybe not so symbolic. Maybe there's something quite factual about it. Uh, so here is point number one, the channel opening to the intuition and closing to the animal nature. That's really something to remember, isn't it? I think so. And here is the capacity of the heart enlarging and to love all that is contacted. That has to do with uh, venomous creatures, you know. Um, snakes, spiders. You know, all of those uh, kinds of creatures, deadly dangerous creatures, sharks and uh, other uh, animals that can easily take uh, end a human incarnation, but the capacity to suffer with all the breeds to love all that is contacted and to understand and sympathize um, with the least desirable of God's creatures. Only then can the work go forward. As desired and only when the development is equable uh, only when the intellect runs not too far ahead of the heart and the mental vibration shuts not out the higher one of the spirit can the student be trusted to acquire powers that wrongly used may result in disaster to the environment uh, as well as to himself. That Somehow that story in Agni Yoga, is it, um, of the Buddha's disciples eager, almost childishly, to do a miracle. And the Buddha was at first uh, hesitant, but then maybe saw the 
possibility of a lesson to be learned. And uh, when the miracle was over and the imbalance, uh, the wrong use of the powers had had its effect, the Buddha revealed to the practitioners, his students, what they had done. Um, as a result of your interference, your meddling, a ship is sinking. Send help, you know, and uh, something like uh, a messenger is being, a, a messenger carrying a vital information is being hunted or endangered by a lion. Send help, you know. They had upset through their childish uh, desire to see the supernatural and to be the wielders of supernatural effects, they had upset the balance. <clears throat> so equability, <laughs> that which is equable, equability, I, I, I don't know <laughs> which word that should be, but uh, this is necessary in the mind, necessary. Maybe a kind of equanimity is the word I'm more familiar with, but something indicating the balanced state, you know. Uh, development is equable and one aspect of the personality does not get too far ahead of another so as to cause um, dangerous imbalance. Well, the wise teacher who is no longer in a hurry in the sense that the students are in a hurry because they still judge by personality standards. Only the wise teacher with a serene point of view uh, can recommend uh, the issue of balance rather than charging ahead into danger, not only for the student, but for others in the environment. Disaster to his environment as well as to himself. Only as he formulates no thoughts, save such as he purposes to make for the helping of the world, can he be trusted wisely to manipulate thought matter, you know? All of these are um, conditions of trust, we might say. And then we have to measure ourselves uh, on the scale of trustworthiness. Okay, that should have been a four. Not a five. So, you know, trustworthy in what sense? Trusted in what sense? He's telling us. Only as he has no desire, save to find out the plans of the master and then assist definitely in making those plans facts in manifestation. Can he be trusted with formulas that will bring the devas of lesser degree under his control? The the devas of equal degree, no. Um, they have to be invited and the quality of what is transpiring has to be such that it will attract their positive attention. But it is possible, as and he gets into this, to command certain lesser devas and uh, especially elementals, and to bring about uh, real storms of disaster. So, no desire save to find out the plans of the master and carry them out. Well then, you know, here's the question. 
then given all this, all these requirements, are we to be trusted? That's the question. The dangers are so great and the perils that beset the unwary students so many that before I proceed further, I have sought to urge caution. Well, probably we don't have any real idea of what he's talking about. Not having confronted these dangers as far as he has, not being experienced as he is, not having seen uh, the onset of disaster in the lives of others and maybe experience them in his own life. So, you know, we don't really yet know what he's saying, but we realize that he's attempting to offer wise counsel. Okay. Let us now specify and enumerate certain dangers that must be guarded against by the uh, man who progresses in meditation. Some of them are due to one cause and some to another, and we shall have to specify with accuracy. I guess we can certainly be prepared for the real experience by attending uh, with uh, solicitousness to uh, what he has to say. So specify and enumerate certain dangers. That's the next little section here. And um, yeah, I think we can go up to a certain point with him up to maybe July the 24th. You know, you can only imagine what it must have been like to be a secretary for the Tibetan the tremendous strain that would be put upon one's mind and nervous system in order to get it right and to be faithful to the quality of the source that is communicating this necessary knowledge. Once Alice Bailey um, talked about why it had been possible for her to accomplished so much in her incarnation. And at first I thought, well, how does she, you know, not really knowing the scope of her work, and maybe I still don't, but um, how does she dare to talk about accomplishing so much? Um, because maybe what she accomplished was not obvious to a beginner like myself. But then as I got into it further and further, I realized the strain that her nervous system must have been under. You know, she was really deep down an experienced disciple, even though the early part of her life was uh, sort of captured by the prevailing almost fundamentalism of the Christian religion, what she really was began to emerge uh, later. And she came into her own. And indeed, she accomplished so much. So she was only speaking the truth. And she was trying to share with others what it was about her approach 
that allowed her to accomplish so much. I'm sure that all of us uh, wish somehow we could accomplish more, could have accomplished more. And uh, as the Tibetan said, for the true initiate, uh, no matter what has been done, it's never enough. But uh, gradually we learn the techniques which allow us uh, to avoid the pitfalls and the wastes of time uh, and all those behaviors, external and internal, which uh, obstruct our full potential for accomplishment. So what are some of these dangers? Number one, danger, dangers inherent in the personality of the pupil. They can, as you foresee, be grouped under three heads, physical dangers, uh, emotional dangers, and mental dangers. Well, I think, you know, that Trinity is always uh, with us as we consider the personality and its uh, serviceable potential and also its um, potential for obstruction. So there are certain conditions based upon our many incarnations and they produce tendencies or um, skandhas, tendencies which uh, have been established and which have momentum to carry them over into our present life and they are preformed, they are our habit nature. He wants us to cultivate the good habits, of course, but there are many that have simply apparently equipped us for survival over many lifetimes and they're not necessarily good. They just allow us to squeak through and uh, not be, you know, uh, eliminated quite so rapidly. So danger is inherent in the personality of the pupil. That's like number one. And then the next is uh, dangers arising from the karma of the pupil. And from his environment, well, I mean, if you live in the uh, slum, slums of a developing country, a third world country, let's call it that, there are all kinds of dangers surrounding you. The danger of drugs, uh, of crime in general, which uh, are an outer threat. But anyway, these dangers, uh, he, he does get into the enumeration of them. So let's see what we have. The uh, karma, A, the karma of his present life his own individual ring pass not as represented by his present life. He has limitations. Um, and it depends on what kind of environment uh, uh, he is placed for the expression of those limitations the man has. Limitations. So the karma, okay, it's um, this is the Saturnian factor. His national heredity and instincts, for instance, whether he possesses an occidental or oriental type of body. So these bodies have to be used correctly 
and not every teacher knows the difference. You have to be quite an expert, I think, to know what to apply and how to apply it to an oriental as opposed to occidental body and vice versa. So one is the karma of his present life. And the other here is the national heredity and instincts. Now, without a, a knowledge of these things, uh, meditation will be wrongly assigned and direction upon the spiritual path may be um, not helpful or even hurtful. And what else? His group affiliations, which, whether exoteric or esoteric, and these uh, these prove to be limiting factors often. And many things which obstruct the individual are found within the individual's uh, group. We do have to remember, however, that the word individual is very close to indivisible and that essentially we are beings that are indivisible. That in itself, uh, I mean, we, we witness fragmentation um, in the psyches of various people. We know they live in a somewhat disintegrated or disintegrating condition, but, you know, essentially the true psyche and especially the spirit is indivisible and it just has to get to that point where it realizes it. So the karma is another factor. So we're enumerating certain dangers and the origins of these dangers. Personality is an inherent danger. You know, we just have to clean up our act before the Christ principle, the soul principle can really appear just the way humanity has to, as a whole, clean up its act before the Christ can reappear, always to a certain extent, and never to the point of perfection, otherwise, uh, who knows, would we ever reach it, ever reach that perfection. So personality dangers and uh, karmic dangers, Uh, the karma of the pupil and of the environment. And then um, the dangers arising from subtle forces that you ignorantly call evil. He certainly is trying to transform our sense of what evil really is because we oftentimes tend to think that when others differ from ourselves, that they are somehow evil. We cannot tolerate, we don't have the adaptability to tolerate uh, and know how to handle and deal with the apparent other. So here is another uh, issue and we'll see on this important subject. Such dangers consist 
in attack on the pupil by extraneous entities on some one plane. And I guess we can say obsession, one such mode of attack, and possession, is a more severe uh, mode. So we do live on a planet where the factor of conflict is pronounced and maybe some of the most difficult conflicts that we have are the um, those that occur between the inner and outer planes. These entities may simply be discarnate human beings. They may be the denizens of other planes who are non-human. Later on, when the student is of sufficient importance to attract notice, the attack may come from those who deal purely with matter. To the hindrance of spiritual growth, the black magicians, the dark brothers, and other forces that appear destructive, you know, I guess the solar logos particularly can find a way to incorporate their machinations into the divine plan. So, you know, we don't want to become paranoid about it and fearful. It's just something that exists in the subtle worlds and uh, it does war militantly, as DK tells us, uh, against the efforts of the true disciple. Uh, and it, it doesn't bother so much those who are not yet consequential in their effect but of course, if we really work for the reappearance of the Christ, there is a certain consequentiality to what we do. And so we have to be, uh, as it is said, marked out for protection. Okay. Okay. No, 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 no. So, um, appear destructive. This appearance is only such when viewed from the angle of time and in our three worlds and is but incidental to the fact that our Logos himself is also evolving. We do not yet have a either a sacred planetary Logos or a even a sacred solar Logos. You know, Venus is the higher example of what Earth can become. Sirius is the higher example of what our solar logos can become. This appearance is only such when viewed from the angle of time and in our three worlds and is but incidental to the fact that our logos himself is also evolving and from the standpoint of the infinitely greater ones who assist him in his development. It is dependent upon his transitory uh, imperfections. The imperfections of nature as we term them are the imperfections of the logos and will eventually be transcendent. So I think we also have to look at those energies which are really inimical to man's progress and those only which appear to be uh, inimical. And we have to realize that even the great ones in whom we live and move and have our being may be and probably are from a certain perspective imperfect. Uh, the imperfect gods, let us say the planetary Logoi, who have not taken whatever 
fifth initiation it is that will render them sacred. Okay. You know, we, we are studying things that appear to be far out, beyond the pale and beyond the normal considerations that we give as we live our life, live our incarnation. And if you really stop to think about the elevation of these um, materials, this type of information, it's very high and must seem like the sheerest fancy even to those who uh, are, are excellent thinkers. So there are these inner inner attacks, and they're so of such a subtle nature that it's difficult to know when they are occurring. It's not like an open enemy. It's more like the enemies of the twelfth house in the chart, which are considered hidden hidden enemies, and therein lies their power their hiddenness, their obscurity, their inability uh, to be uh, easily detected. When do they come near the aura? Uh, when are they a danger? Can we sense the approach of these negative entities? So DK says, I guess he's getting near the end of that letter for today. I have therefore outlined for you this morning the material I shall seek to impart during the coming days. This must have been a bit of a orienting relief for Alice Bailey, who at least uh, then would have the sense Hmm. Yeah, so we're at July 24th, 1920. And we'll continue, you know, this, as I say, it looks like an approximately 50 page section in which at the foundation of our studies with the Tibetan, in an early book, relatively, or early impartation, we're being given a warning about how best to pursue, how best to use what will be given in almost another 30 years of work. 30 years of work were planned the Tibetan tells us, Alice Bailey didn't pass away by accident. Uh, it was 30 years of work planned and uh, carried forth in an exemplary manner. Of course, those closest to the work will know if there was more that was intended but could not be brought through. Yet, um, I think we'll all agree that we have been given more than we could ever assimilate, more than we could ever absorb. So that will be it for today. We've gone as far as uh, page 92. And uh, let's see, is it from 87 to 92, something like that? I try to get this uh, yeah it looks like we started here yep 87 to 92 almost 93 and I'll carry this um, down and 
so we know where we are when we begin again. It's a wonderful book. And uh, whether we read it in the beginning of our work, as some have done, uh, or whether we read it for the first time or again in the later uh, part after many years of study with the Tibetan, it still is uh, foundational and it still fills in the blanks, so many of them, you know. So this was the end of 24, a good shambolic number. And uh, it's the 20 of August. And we went to page 92. And then we'll begin with program number 25 next time, which will begin at 92. Page, um, okay, this is page 87 to 92. I guess um, deep assimilation of the material is what we strive for here. And uh, let it really sink in and determine uh, our behavior on three different levels. And let, let this material help us confront almost inevitable dangers to be encountered on three different uh, levels. So we we'll begin at 92 next time on the XX of August. Hopefully it will be August. I think so. And maybe even later tonight. Could be. We will continue with the discussion of the dangers. Okay, friends. Lots of love, many blessings from Tuya and myself and the whole communications team um, that tries to, you know, keep this life-giving teaching flowing towards you and incidentally uh, assisting those who help the flow. We'll be working together again shortly. Bye for now.